Well, good morning. It's great to be here with all of you, and I'm uh, delighted to have this opportunity to share a few thoughts that I think are very complementary and build on the, the comments we've heard from Angela and Calvin already this morning. But because I work for the National Trust for Historic Preservation, I want to take a step back and go back 50 years uh, and start with the words of, uh, some words of wisdom of a great urban activist whom many of you in this room know, one of the founding thinkers of the modern preservation movement, uh, Jane Jacobs. In 1961, she wrote, cities need old buildings so badly, it's probably impossible for vigorous streets and districts to grow without them. And by this, she meant that old buildings provide character and they help ensure mixed use. They offer space for entrepreneurs and local businesses, artists and inventors. They help keep neighborhoods affordable for families from all walks of life so that the streets buzzed with activity at all times of the day. Jane Jacobs called that energy of the city the sidewalk ballet, and she asserted that it was the key to thriving urban areas. She believed that cities were created by and for people. Now that may seem very intuitive to us today, but when she wrote those words in 1961, she was out of step with and in many ways ahead of her time. She had a nemesis, a great nemesis, that's sort of the Goliath to her David. Um, his name was Robert Moses, and he was a, the master builder of New York. Over his career, he built more than 600 miles of highway, 13 bridges and two tunnels. He believed that cities were created by and for traffic. And he often ripped out entire neighborhoods to accomplish his vision, neighbor, and many times neighborhoods of color, such as in the Bronx. For over a decade, these two titans clashed over the future of the American city, and it got heated and it got personal. Jane Jacobs didn't win every battle that she took on with Robert Moses, but she won more than she lost, and over the years, she helped articulate um, a theory about cities and to turn the tide on urban renewal projects that had devastated so many American neighborhoods. And her writings and her thinking really created the foundation of today's modern preservation movement. A half a century later today, we now know for a fact that older buildings are critical to the success of our cities, that they foster jobs um, and economic growth, that they can make our cities healthier, uh, more sustainable, and more affordable. And they can bring us together and help make our cities and neighborhoods more equitable and inclusive. And I want to share with you today some research that we've been doing at the National Trust that brings Jane Jacobs' theories that were ideas and, and observations of hers 50 years ago and, and turns them into empirical data that we can really rely on. Because we have today available computers and, and, and data at our fingertips that, of course, Jane Jacobs couldn't even dream of at the time. So we've been putting her theories to the test. And in 2014, the National Trust released a report called Older, Smaller, Better. It evaluated the age, the diversity of age, and the size of all buildings, not just historic buildings, but all the buildings in three cities, in Washington, D.C., in San Francisco, and in Seattle using GIS mapping technology and some really innovative data sources like cell phone usage patterns, we examined how every block performed according to different economic, social, cultural, and environmental metrics. And what we found is exactly what Jane Jacobs predicted, that neighborhoods with a mix of older and newer buildings tend to have more small business jobs and more diversity in housing costs, meaning more opportunity for people all along the economic spectrum. These blocks of old and new buildings have hidden density, meaning more people and businesses per commercial square foot than areas with just new buildings. They're more walkable and they have more creative jobs. They have more new and women and minority-owned businesses, more non-chain businesses, and they show more activity on evenings and weekends. 
This is a map of cell phone usage in Seattle on a Friday night, and the areas that are darker red are the places of where there's the most activity, and they happen to be the historic neighborhoods in Seattle. And you thought it was just the National Security Administration who was tracking your cell phone activity, and now you know it's the National Trust for Historic Preservation, too. But excited by these findings, we wanted to expand our work. And last year, we launched a new product, a, a new report called the Atlas of Urbanism. You can find both of these on our website, savingplaces.org. It takes the same approach that we used in Older, Smaller, Better and, and expands it to 50 cities across the country. And once again, what we found is really quite remarkable. Across all 50 cities in the Atlas, when compared to areas with just new buildings, we found that the areas with a mix of old and new buildings have more new business jobs, more small business jobs, these older areas have more women and minority-owned businesses and more diverse populations in general. In fact, 75% more Americans of color live in these older neighborhoods. And there are 27% more affordable housing units. And in every city in the Atlas, there's greater population density and greater density of housing units on blocks with older, smaller, mixed-aged buildings. So we're really excited by what this data is telling us and our ability to prove empirically what Jane Jacobs posited 50 years ago. But the case for preservation really has been right in front of our eyes over, this, over these past 50 years. And one area that I know particularly well is Denver, Colorado, because I grew up in Loveland, Colorado, which is about 70 miles to the north. And Denver was my first big city. Today, Denver is an, a powerhouse in almost every way that counts. They have a growing population, low unemployment rate, and they're always on these indexes of some of the healthiest people in the United States. So how has Denver become such a, such a thriving place? There were people like Jane Jacobs who early on were spurring the, the community there to think about preservation as a path to the future. And while Jane Jacobs was fighting Robert Moses in New York, there was a developer named Dana Crawford who was working to revitalize a neighborhood there called Larimer Square. Now, when I was growing up, in Loveland, downtown Denver was a little bit of a scary place to be. It was pretty down at the heels, uh, lacking investment. And as with so many other urban renewal plans in the 1960s, Denver planned to revitalize its downtown mostly by tearing it down. Already nearly 30 blocks of the downtown had been destroyed. And I want to ask you to keep your eyes on the bell tower behind me between the two arrows. So this is Denver, Colorado before urban renewal, so-called urban renewal, and here it is afterwards. Lerm <laughs> It's better living through parking lots, I think. And I think or Robert Moses would have been very proud of the city leaders of Denver at the time, creating a city by and for traffic, clearly. But Larimer Square was up in the uh, upper right-hand uh, corner of this picture, and it's one of the few places that survived the wrecking ball. And that's because Dana Crawford had a very different vision. She believed that people would rather live in a place that kept its historic character. It wasn't always an easy lift, and she'll tell you that, but by the 1980s, Larimer Square was a really powerful example of what could be accomplished. And inspired by this success, Denver really got on board at that point and created a lower downtown historic district. They put a moratorium on the demolition of historic buildings, and they helped pass the third historic tax, state tax credit in the United States. And it's really paid off for them. Lodo, as it's now known, or Lower Downtown, is considered the most thriving part of the city. It has the lowest commercial vacancy rates around. Now, another example um, is right here in Los Angeles and the amazing transformation that's taken place in the downtown here. 17 years ago, a partnership between neighborhood groups, city leaders, and developers led to an adaptive reuse ordinance that made it easier to reuse the historic buildings in the downtown here. It removed regulatory barriers like burdensome parking requirements and helped make it possible to repurpose more than 60 historic buildings as apartments, lofts, and hotels, many of them from the early 20th century that had sat vacant for decades. 
As a result, the population in these neighborhoods tripled, and downtown LA is now a thriving residential and commercial hub with an astonishing 14,000 new housing units and older buildings. So we now have the tools and the data to replicate these successes all over the United States, and we have an amazing opportunity, as Al Angela and Calvin said, with the most, two most, uh, the most diverse population and the largest, the millennials, leading this drive back into cities, followed closely by the second largest generation, empty nesting baby boomers who are also moving back, back downtown. But you might ask, how do we make this happen in our town? How can we follow LA's adaptive reuse example and revive more of the old buildings where we live? Over the past couple of years, the National Trust has been partnering with the Urban Land Institute to figure this out and to determine exactly what policies are working in cities across the United States to facilitate building reuse and how they can best be promoted and implemented. We've talked with city officials, planners, developers, community activists, and leaders in, in five cities, in Baltimore, uh, Philadelphia, Detroit, Chicago, and here in Los Angeles, to examine the specific barriers to building reuse and to obtain really specific recommendations for how to unlock all of this potential. Tomorrow, we're releasing our comprehensive report from those five studies, and it, it suggests really practical policy tools that communities can use, such as flexible zoning requirements to make it easier to re-employ older buildings. And we've included a model adaptive reuse ordinance that can be tailored, we hope, to meet the needs of any city. I also today want to put in a special word for a particular tool that's made an enormous difference across the, the country, and that's federal historic tax credits, which are often paired with new markets tax credits and low-income housing tax credits to revitalize historic buildings. The tax credit is our most significant federal preservation initiative, and since 1981, it's created two and a half million jobs, attracted, as you can see, almost $120 billion in private investment and helped transform 40,000 commercial buildings across the United States. And what's even better is that the United States Treasury and all of us as American citizens make $1.20 for every dollar that's invested in these tax credits. And 75% of the benefits stay in the local community which is why 34 states, including Denver, Colorado, have created their own state historic credits. But despite these really compelling statistics and the great um, benefits that I see on the ground all the time, these tax credits, as well as, as the others I've mentioned, are, are currently at risk as our country debates tax reform. So I hope that all of you will, will take a minute to speak to your member of Congress about what the, what kind of difference the tax credits are making and to put in a plug that they need to stay in our reform tax code. So we have a lot of resources available on our website and I hope you'll look for those because we stand ready to provide our expertise and resources to those of you who are thinking about how to unleash the historic buildings and the potential that you have in their midst. Our for-profit subsidiary, the National Trust Community Investment Corporation has helped invest more than $1 billion in tax credit equity for over 100 worthy real estate projects in communities across the country. And we're now working to expand these efforts. We recently embarked on a partnership with one of America's national banks to leverage another $100 million towards community revitalization projects. And last year, we launched the, our new historic real estate fund to provide private non-tax credit capital to developers who are working on historic rehabilitation projects. Because we believe that investments like these really can create a multiplier effect and that spurs neighborhood revival. We've seen it again and again. And as ULI's own Ed McMahon likes to say, place is what you, makes your hometown different from my hometown. In the old economy, markets mattered. In the new economy, place matters the most. At the National Trust, we believe that our, our lives are better when we tap into these historic resources and unlock all of this amazing potential. And we look forward to working with you uh, to bring these great benefits to communities across the country. Thank you all very much.